You're going to do another one? My monitor is a little weird. It's really weird. I'm glad that hearing turned out to be good. I don't know. I think she came to me twice. Hello and TV land out there. Are you all ready for us to begin the recording? Good. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Ordinance Committee meeting of May 13th. I'm City Councilor David Murphy, I chair of the committee. With me are Councilor Jesse Adams and Councilor Maureen Carney. I think I call Maureen Tolan. This is the Ordinance Committee. I want to announce tonight that we have full media coverage. Mary is doing an audio recording. Mary is taking notes. The North Street Neighborhood Association is videoing this meeting. You can find them at northassoc.org. So it's N-O-R-T-H-A-S-S-O-C.org. Keep it green. And this video will be available there. Tonight. Tonight. Okay. And, uh, and also we're being recorded by NCTV as well, and we'll be on NCTV at some point in the menu. You can watch, you can watch us there as well. Um, with that being said, um, we will approve minutes of our meeting of April 10th. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. And now we will accept public comment. If anyone is here to make general public comment, we will accept that now. We'll also be doing a public hearing at 7 o'clock, so if you're here to talk about the zoning changes, we will be probably best to do public comment at that point. She certainly can join us now, but she may have to vacate when the planning board shows up for the public hearing if there's not enough room for everybody. Uh, seeing no one rushing up for public comment at this point, we will continue on to do the claims portion of our meeting. The first claim is the tow claim from December 27, 2012, the Deutschman claim. Is there anybody here for that claim that wants to speak to us? No? No? Okay. Um, and Councillor Seawall recommends denial of this towing reimbursement. Any discussion on this one? Well, I have a question. It seems like her, her point is that she was physically unable to move her car, right? Um, I guess the solicitor's position is that that doesn't take her out of the requirements and, and the, the mandate that she has to move her car. Actually, she without prejudice should be able to perhaps make it at some point. Okay. Sure. No. I'm wondering if she called the uh, police department to let them know she was incapacitated and would, would not be able to move the car or anything. And wouldn't be able to get a neighbor or anything. The next claim is property damage January 30, 31, 2013, Damari, D-A-M-E-R-I, Damari. Is there anyone here to speak to that claim? No one is here. This all 
also is recommended for denial by a pregnancy law. Based on the um, Supreme Court How property damage February 14, 2013, and February 27, 2013. Is there anyone to speak to the how claim here? I don't see anyone. Uh, Solicitor Sewell has recommended denial of this claim. We have the Robinson claim, February 17, 2013, and I bet there's somebody here to speak to that. So please uh, identify yourself. And I'm um, Steve Robinson, the owner of the vehicle. This is my wife. She was driving the vehicle, at, or parked actually. Um, February 17th, um, she took my daughter into town to um, go shopping on her birthday, and when she came back to her car parked in front of Eclipse, she noticed that the mirror was, was crushed and there were scratches all over the driver's door and front quarter panel. She called me frantically. I told her, call the police, make a report, which she did. Police got there, looked up and said, found the street lamp head that had fallen on our car. It took out the mirror and scratched the car. And he wrote up a police report and he said, Joe Cook will probably take care of it. He called us later on that afternoon at home and said, yeah, contact Joe Cook, they'll write you a check. So I called my insurance company on Monday just to confirm. They called Joe Cook. He said he wasn't going to cover it because somebody must have hit that pole, which caused it to come down, so we should go after the person and hit the pole. I took pictures of the pole. It was not hit. And the police report says the vehicle was not involved in we weren't. We weren't. A, head, a street lamp to, fell on the that's car. That's what I'm saying. It goes, to, it goes to your point that police are putting reiterate that, right? Right. That's what I'm confused about. I'm confused about the recommendation to deny. I mean, the police report says the vehicle I highlighted was not involved in a hit run accident. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure where Mr. Cook came to that conclusion. Because it was just city property and it was faulty. We're basically looking for what we paid out of pocket, not the whole claim. The claim was was almost three thousand dollars to fix the car, brand new car, maybe six or eight months old. But we're just looking for what it cost us out of our pocket to Acme Automotive. All right. So what they're what they're basically they're using the same position that City of No Notice that the lamp just fell. After speaking with my attorney this afternoon, he assures me that um, ignorance is not a defense in this typic typical case. N not knowing that it wasn't broken doesn't mean it 
release you from obligation that it was broken. Well, that might not necessarily be true. I mean, there's, if we're on notice, and you, you just heard us deny several claims, it's because, uh, for example, when someone drives over a pothole, and unfortunately, if they were the first person uh, to, to notify the city right. of it, meaning we didn't have notice prior, then we're actually not liable. Right. After that point, we are My bucket sure. truck must be somewhere else. I couldn't have checked to see if that headlamp was loose. I mean, come on. What happens if my wife was getting out of the car at the time that street lamp fell on her and my daughter? We'd be in a different courtroom right now. Thank goodness that did not happen. Yeah. Goodness, yeah. Thank goodness that did not But, you know, I mean, it's the city of Northampton where I was born and raised. My father was born and raised. It was a faulty street lamp. I don't see where the issue is. I know that. Um when we make reference to that Massachusetts law, it's making reference to defects in the public way, mm -hmm. potholes and things like that. I don't know if those actually pertain to equipment like uh, you know, a street lamp, and that's why it would be helpful to have the city solicitor here. Um, I don't have that piece of uh, Massachusetts law, but it, I understand it makes reference to defects in the public way. And so it sounds like they're using that same statute. Defects in the public way to yeah, apply to, to the defective street lamp. And I don't know. I mean, I believe I need a little help in this morning. Well, do you want to continue and, and particularly query Solicitor Seawall about his interpretation that the street lamp is part of the way? Yeah, and in fact, actually, there's a, there's a couple other notes here. It looks like there's a, something from Joe Cook saying, according to Chris Mason, our energy guy, we own the fixture head, but not the pole. Um, but it wasn't the pole that fell. No, no it was just the fixture head. All right. And that was in question to... Um, the question was asking, I think, believe that Mr. Cook does believe it's a defect in way issues very in his letter. Yeah. But we certainly, if you want to continue, we could specifically ask uh, yeah. Attorney Seawall to address that because we have lots of them where the where the defect in the public way is a pothole or something oh, I understand. Road or missing mantle cover. But I don't recall one where yeah. a street lamp from the sky falling is public Did you way, receive so. all of the, did you receive copies oh, of yeah. all of these? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'm just curious. It um, looks like Joe Cook writes, um, this is a defect in the way case, I'd say. And for us to have liability, the defect has to be the sole cause of the property damage. Here we have a criminal act as the cause. He's determining somebody hit the pole, but I took pictures. Yeah. There's no right, dents in the pole. Right, so, so yeah. he said it was somebody who hit, and then the police confirmed that it wasn't somebody who hit. So then we got the note that says we own the we own the fixture head, not the pole. Mm -hmm. So we're just backtracking from there, and so I'm just trying to figure out how they then yeah. came to the final conclusion that. So. Yeah, and I don't. The recommendation is from Alan, but I don't see where he actually specifically addresses. The issue the way Joe does, and I do a betting Joe sort of talking about somebody must have conked the pole to make it fall down, and that does not appear to be the case. So. Yeah, so I mean, I don't have anything that confirms, except Joe Cook saying in his in his initial e email that he thinks it's a defect in the way case, um, and that it's you know a uh, hit and run criminal. And then, but then that's debunked. Um, so I don't see in this trail of emails, at least, they why don't. they came to the conclusion that it is. Because they so. just deny it automatically, I assume. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I just think um, it was. It well, was the problem is, Joe, uh, the police officer talked to Joe Cook that Sunday, and Joe had told him. Yeah, we'll pay for well, it. Well, also, I spoke to him on Monday morning. She and spoke to he, Joe. He, through, he said, sent me forms, yep. email forms, and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that's wondered, why we're here. Said, but yeah. um, do you want what? What I might recommend is we continue and then ask Attorney Seawall to specifically bring 
some closure by oh, yeah. reviewing Joe and reviewing police, and then because I've never seen one where they consider a streetlight fixture yeah. part of the public way so that it's covered by that. Because that's yeah. what our communication to you says. It says that the solicitor has recommended denial based on the language of the statute in jail. You didn't know it was defective. The city had no notice of defect in the lamp that fell on the vehicle at this time. But I certainly would like him to confirm that that still applies to something hanging in the air. Right. You know, over I mean, the way. If this turret off City Hall were to fall off a passerby, <laughs> I, I don't know whether that would the same, be the same, you know, the same liability. thing or not. But, I mean, we certainly can ask him. And I'm, I'm not comfortable denying the claim tonight without asking him. And I'm not comfortable paying the claim without asking. Um, I wish his response was more complete. But. I'm also curious about why Mr. Cook said he approved and denied it, right? We because can't figure that maybe, out. Maybe it turns on, you know, something else. Yeah. But it just, it's a little ambiguous for me to do either tonight. Move to continue. To our, next, to our next meeting, which is June the 10th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we will so we get the solicitor to more. You're welcome to come back on the 10th if you want. Sorry, but it's. Will we get another letter in the mail? Or yes. It's, yeah. Okay. okay. Letting you know we're going to ask our questions of the okay. solicitor. Thank you. I didn't know he wasn't going to be with us tonight. So. Okay. That's not a problem. Yeah. Thanks All right. for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay out from under street lights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Part yes. <of> <laughs> All right, the next one is the Cronin property damage claim of February 28th. Is there anyone here to speak to the Cronin claim? And this is one that City Solicitor Seawall recommends that we deny. Based on our DPW review, no one, um, two calls, and one is from the claimant. And he's saying there wasn't sufficient time right. before. To because those calls were on March 1st and the... Was filled the next day. And, and, and it was, um, the accident happened on March 1st. Oh, 28th. Yeah. Okay. So they weren't prior. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll move to deny. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? And then the last one is the Warren property damage claim of March 12th, 2013. Um, and this is recommended for denial by Attorney Seymour. This is the return of the merger of the historic district commission into the historical commission. And this, as I recall, um, showed up and Attorney Seenwall felt that it did not it did not comply with the requirements of state statute 40C that creates historic districts because it didn't it didn't uh, create its membership in the manner that 40C stipulated, and the planning director, do you, uh, Carolyn, are you familiar with this one? Yes. Do you want to recognize her and have her come and speak to us? Recognize her. Yes. Can you please make one um, comment for you? Is that on the third page? There's the under B appointment to city solicitor, and that's one word changed. In the third line, it says the mayor shall decide what historical district commission members you should say with. Okay. All in favor, Carolyn? Aye. Aye. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so as you, 
as you noted, there were some semantic issues or word smithing that needed to be done with the ordinance. Um, and so that's what's in front of you. So I think um, legally and technically, it's um, the uh, city solicitor is fine with the way it's, it's set up now. And it's, um, I, don't, I don't recall if you're at your last meeting you talked about um, the concept or the reasons behind merging the two, but it really comes down to staffing issues and trying to consolidate um, where we can so that we can provide it. Um, we did not do an in-depth on this the last time because even when it got here, the solicitor said, oh, right. I'm not done with this yet. So do you yeah. want to explain it? Since, since we're sure. on television, and <laughs> you want to, maybe I'll even take your picture if they're nice. <laughs> no, uh, no need for that. <laughs> can you explain to us the, the, what, how it will work sure. for the folks riveted to this at home? <laughs> um, so it, we basically now have an Elm Street district um, um, body that just focuses on review of permits that come and that, that deal with any changes for properties in the Elm Street corridor. And then we have a separate historic commission that essentially deals with everything else that relates to um, review and policy related to preserving historic buildings in the city. And so, um, and so, sometimes we've had overlap in membership in that some people serve on both boards. But um, since they're both dealing with uh, preservation of um, important historic structures within the city, um, and they're, um, there's uh, one, there's more of a permit capacity, I guess I would say, in Elm Street District currently than there is under Historic Commission. But at any rate, they um, both deal with um, permitting to some degree, and then also policy changes as it relates to historical. Um, resources in the community. So we feel like merging them um, uh, is an effective way to um, help with staff shortages and timing and um, all those things that relate to trying to get boards, um, staff support, and review permits. I do have one question about it, because I, I served on this body for several years, and I was the, the real estate person, because 40C required one of the people to be in the real estate business. But it, it did require those recommendations to come from the local realtor association, and I see that's been struck out of this. But I don't think that's been removed from 40C. Do you know? Um, I don't know about the legislation. No, I haven't followed that. I'm sorry. I, I can certainly try to get that information for you before, your, before the full council meets. Um, Is that, that's the only, I just wanted to get to kind of I mean, the membership for the whole thing is still indicating that there will be one person yeah. licensed in real estate <coughs> or construction. One, they're still licensed in real estate. Um, um, license I think what you're looking at is sort of the scrapping of the entire, that whole entire paragraph and then replacing it with this new. So it's just sort of reorganized, but it's still there. I, um, uh, membership four. And there's a typo. <laughs> but when I look look in a B or A membership on the last page, it should consist of seven members. The mayor shall appoint 
time. So we have one who resides in the district. We have one member appointed from two nominations submitted by the Northampton Historical Society. We have one architect. We have one licensed real estate or construction industry person. So that's four members. Uh, where, where's the other three? Do you have that? Um, I'm looking at that now. I. Um I think it's really just spelling out the membership um, that um, the specified membership, and right. then the rest of the members can be like broader based. Right. Does the mandate Right. Does it? Right. Does, 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 right. does it follow where the rest of them? I don't see any. <clears throat> I don't see any number actually specified. It says, yeah, the commission shall not exceed seven members at, oh. later on, but also the membership shall consist of seven members. The mayor shall appoint all the members subject to council. The commission shall include, and then at these are the specific one. ones, and then the remainder would be, you know, anyone, um, essentially at large. <laughs> not be less than seven. Right. Okay. Four of whom are. And the difference is that person previously was appointed or nominated at least from the, the uh, Milford Association? Because yeah, right. actually originally there were five members and two alternates. It was five. So there were five voting members. So there can be nominations. Um, I mean, there are other bodies that specify nominations that, I mean, mm -hmm. that were because originally, the original, um, the AIA had to nominate the architect, but there's not that many AIA affiliated architects around here. And then the Real Estate Association nominated two and they picked one. And then the Historic Commission nominated two and they picked one. Um, I don't think that it got lost. I think that by merging the two that sort of ha had some overlapping mission, but also in, in, in the Historic Commission's um, case, it was a broader mission than just Elm Street. And I think when Elm Street was created, it was such a, um, you know, narrow-focused body um, that I think at the time that was, um, that was considered appropriate to have you know, a, a, a body, a professional body um, select the members. So, I mean, I don't know that it would um, hurt per se, but I think, um, I think the, um, my understanding is that it's part of that merger sort of saying, well, do we, do we, does it really need to come from this body because sometimes we have trouble getting people to select one of their own members and... Well, there's reasoning given actually for the without require for the architect saying, for example, without requiring an AIA nominee, since many Northampton architects are not AIA members. So I'm just right. wondering if there's a similar reasoning and would maybe if yes it true that many of the authors are not No, most of the Northampton ones are. Well, you know, some communities are different, but most of us are. I don't know if there'd be any objection to having them. Basically, it would, the process would then just be to seek nominations from the, yeah. the professional body. body yeah. and I just and I just want to be sure that that forty the statute doesn't still say that, but you can check that easily. Yeah. You know. yep. Thank you. Thank you. You're always wrong. Yep. You can check that, but uh, all right. So pending. Uh, so, so you're you're and, to send with a positive recommendation and then we're just as amended with the what to which. With the what to which. <laughs> with the what to which amendment. Okay. And, um, and, uh, and I'm comfortable with that too, so long as uh, planning is happy to right. determine whether the 
40 C still says nominations from those entities and that we can in fact strike that. And there's seven, these seven members. The historic commission is larger than seven. Um, I know you don't. I don't, it. yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall. I think we're actually down membership, which is another problem. Yeah. We have lots of vacancies. Yeah. Because if, 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 if it's full seven, then we want to be sure that. And both, I should say, both these bodies have t discussed this and looked at yeah. it for a long time, and so, and, mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're both on board. Acquiescing to the change. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I'll, I would support it as amended, provided we actually make sure that removing those, those recommendations is, is consistent with 40C. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. The next ordinance is expand historic district to include much of Round Hill. This was referred on April 4th. And economic development land use has dealt with it. Have they, um, and Mary, you, Ed Lou has dealt with this one? Yes, when Councilor Freeman Daniels voted no, and then Councilor Schwartz was not actually even at that. She was not with us. She came in the meeting later. Mm -hmm. So this. We have comments. Yeah, it's just, it's just very. Do we know what some of the. The, uh, the opposing vote is uh, actually with us this okay. evening in the okay. flesh in the form of Councilor Freeman Daniels. Shall we see if we can induce him to come up and tell us what his issue was? Thank you, sir. I have no comment on this ordinance. But you did not vote. Okay. And will, will we find in the minutes that we receive on Thursday some of what the reasoning might have been in the opposition? They need to approve. They never know. Okay. We may never know. So, uh, oh, Carolyn, you can't leave the hot seat yet. <laughs> <laughs> our fun tonight is only beginning. We're we'll trying to keep this entertaining for our folks at home. So, so this um, has been around for a while now, the, the bulk of this property is the Park School property that Opal just purchased and is affected by a development agreement that Opal has already made with the city. Right. There are properties that are not included in that, but you're right. Most of it is that. And in fact, one of the reasons why um, um, the ordinance was um, requested to be put uh, delayed in terms of a vote or moving forward to council was um, based on Opal's request. They wanted to make sure, and, and Clark's request actually, they wanted to make sure they had a deal finalized with Opal before any changes were made because they were concerned about what impact it might have um, for the uh, sale of the property. All right, so. So the benefit of uh, expanding the historic district is just to um, maybe just uh, expand on that. <clears throat> yes. Um I, I think the conversation first arose in, with the concern about the preservation of the campus. Uh, and there was a lot of discussion, lots and lots of neighborhood input, which um, I think at your full council meeting, um, the ward council will um, gladly go into. Um, but this was has overwhelming support from the neighborhood and from the district uh, to look at where there are other significant pro historic properties that are visible from the street and sort of a would um, the, the boundary, expanding the boundary would then allow additional protection. But originally um, the idea came out of a concern about what would happen if 
someone came and bought the buildings at Clark and significantly altered the way the campus looked. So, but that it is no longer an if because the development agreement is in place. Right, but the neighbor, so the other piece of it is there was, there was a study commissioned by um, the Historic District Committee about what sort of the best route to take in order to help preserve that campus, but also the other significant buildings that have since been sold off by Clark. They once were owned by Clark, but have now been put to um, new uses. And um, so that study, um, the recommendation was to expand the district as a, as a, a tool um, for the other buildings that aren't part of the Opal campus as well. And there's, it's also, a, I would venture to say, it's also um, steeped in history, that area there with the Clark School going back to the 19th century and the buildings up on Brown Hill. Right. So essentially, we're adding 19 properties that aren't open and putting them in a historic district. I trust your numbers. I didn't count them. It's, yeah. in, the, it's in the ballpark, so we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're putting on it. And of those, one, two, three, four of those buildings are. 60s or newer, so they're not particularly currently of historic nature. Um, yeah, the one, um, I, can, I can read you off some though if you're looking at them. Um, building 35 was built in like 71. Uh, 91 is even newer than that. That's like built in the last two years or something like that. And then under 19, it doesn't have a number, it's right the, behind. Uh, Helen Hills Chapel, mm -hmm. that's like an 80s vintage townhouse thing. There's several of them. There's two, two or three others. The building to the left, those buildings to the left of that one under 19 are all sort of these townhousey looking things. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that is just to provide connectivity to the other district because that, right. that is of no significance. Um, the remainder, the dozen or so? Um, some of them are, you know, the rest of them are, are older buildings. Some have been condo converted. Some are still single family houses. Um, yeah, Bancroft. So there's 83, 93, 96, 88's condos, 84's condos, 95's a single family, 91's brand new, 87 is. An old house. 83 is the former president's house. Uh, and then 35 is, a, is new. 23 and 19 are old, the one under there. So, so there's some of them are old, some of them are new. Well, it's really intended for the swath of land here at the campus. Yeah, and then the big piece in the middle is essentially already covered by the development agreement. So the bulk of it in the middle is. I think the idea was also, as you mentioned, even though there's some newer buildings, was to create a sense of, um, and as you said, Councillor Carney, the um, it has a, the campus itself has a um, long story, and um, and had outbuildings that are have now since been sold, but they were once part of that, you know, whole thriving campus. So I think even though some of them may have been our newer buildings, is still part of that package. But this will, you have the development agreement, but the Opal buildings would still be subject to this review. Yes. In, in addition, so we have the development agreement, and then we're going to, we're going to layer this on top of that. Right. And they have historic district, um, because they got the, with the credit, the tax credits. Mm -hmm. They're required so to they're required to be yeah. have the development agreement, yeah. but not necessarily the, this district on top of that. No, but they don't have a problem with having it because they have to stick to the historic integrity of those buildings anyway, based on their financing. So every time they pull a building permit now, do they have to come to this body under no. the development agreement? No. Um, because they will under this. 
Um, I think it depends on what they're what their what the change is. So if there's a visible change in the character, that's what triggers a permit. But does it with the current development agreement, do they have to come to the historic district commission anytime they pull an exterior permit now or will they only need to do that if the district is created? Um, and the development agreement that you're referring to, I am not sure if I'm understanding your well, question. Opal had to they've already signed a preservation development agreement in advance to get the tax credits in advance of their purchase. Right. So that's in place now. Does that require them to come to the Historic District Commission every time they pull an exterior building permit to prove to the commission it doesn't alter something of the I don't think they, uh, well, um, I think yes, they have to show that any exterior, I think they have to do that because they're bound to show that they're not changing the um, exterior facade. So the question you're asking, do they do that, and can it simultaneously be uh, reviewed by the Elm Street, which has now emerged, um, which would potentially now be a merged body. So I think it would, be, it would happen at the same time. Right, but do you, do you know for sure they need to do that, or is it just? I have to look at the language of the, um, his, of the agreement. Um, for their tax credits, because I don't, I don't, I have not studied that because it was, you know, it's, they, that's approved separately, that's not a city, you know, mandated approval because of their financing, so I don't, I have not looked at those details. Because that would be, oh, see, see, it's, it is, that's the one part of this that's really burdensome, is anytime anybody takes out an exterior building from in one of these historic districts, they have to, before they get the permit, they have to go before this board to determine that, in fact, it is consistent with the board's opinion of what the building's like. And that, that could be a really cumbersome thing. Um, well, that's changed, actually. There's, a, there's a initial, there's review initially to make a determination whether there's a change. And if there's not a change, then it doesn't go for hearing. Um, and and I would just add that um, Opal ha is very supportive of this. They don't have an issue with this expansion at all. Mm -hmm. That was my question. If they're not, if they haven't expressed a concern. <coughs> would you? Do you mind continuing this so I can check on that relationship? Thank you. Because I specifically would like to have the answer. So you, your question is whether they need to go the, the, to two different the, the bodies difference, for review. What well, the difference would be between the historic, the, 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 the um, its membership in the historic district and the development agreement that's already signed. That's really what I wanted to get to the bottom of. And certainly if we continue this to our next meeting on the 10th, I would have time to do that. Okay. by the solicitor, uh, but 
we would essentially sponsor this change in ourselves and the way we do business. So these are the ordinances that we asked the solicitor to review that may be in conflict with the, uh, no. No, these are, this essentially is to take the claims process out of this committee and essentially the claims would be uh, dutifully submitted to our insurer so that the people would, they would make a claim, it would get reviewed and submitted to our insurer and dealt with in that manner. It would not come to this committee any longer and it would, we'd essentially change our name to the committee on rules and ordinances and orders and take out elections and claims. And what about elections? We don't really deal with that. And, and elections is also dealt with under the charter. So is, is the purpose of is this, um, is this uh, does this come from any Yeah, this actually came from um, the solicitor and the mayor viewing budgets and functions and, and determining that um, that they that in their opinion they recommended that we change our process. Uh, particularly with claims, I think it's elections is kind of an old by the way, but just to change the claims process and allow the city's insurer to make determinations as to what claim is payable and what claim isn't payable. So the solicitor would review it. It would get set to the insurer, not to us. No? So it would just get processed and sent to the insurer. to voice their opinion. For example, we heard people here tonight that um, got to present their case to us. And I think that it's set up this way because we're independent from the administration. And as, as opposed to in, in administration, you know, in administration is equivalent to an internal review and determine that, you know, probably in most times that, they, that they, they are correct. I think that's why it comes here. I understand that. I understand the solicitor sticks, um, unless if that's the way it's done for the other communities. That's interesting to know. But this, to me, seems to be a pretty good process. So I'm not sure if I can support it if it's if, if it does away with a person's ability to. to uh, it does do away with their ability to come and stand in front of the city council committee and plead their case. I would That'll also point, just in my experience on this committee, um, we have had. On, on numerous occasions, have a disagreement with the conclusion of the solicitor, and it was, I mean, we were informed that basically it was our call as, a, as an appeal committee, so to speak, to, um, to decide the outcome of the claim, or even some, you know, uh, splitting of the difference. We had that, we had that authority, it was going to be, with um, the ordinance Well, there's a reference here, too, that I'm not really sure is entirely appropriate. Um, the process has the added benefit of not placing staff, city solicitor, and counselors who comprise the committee in an adversarial position vis-a-vis -vis the citizen claimants. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily adversarial uh, with, because I where actually it's like more of a judicial uh, function. Right. Sometimes we will have faith it's not an adversarial. Right, right. And if, if, any, if, the, if there are adversaries per se, I can see where there's staff, city solicitor, who may be person who write a decision, um, but not the counselor supervise the committee. Mm -hmm. so it seems like the, the committee members serve in a different function. 
So we kind of lumped together. Sounds like so mm -hmm. it's a game battery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not yours. Um, it could be seen differently. I don't know if I'm, I'm seeing this for the first time, really. So. Yeah, that's, that's why I was hoping the solicitor would be present because okay. I, uh, I wouldn't be prepared to support this tonight. Not only exactly. that, Frank Amendi is coming upon the recommendation of this committee. Okay, because they, it, it was. It was the solicitor's intent that I think we'd be the sponsors of this. Because yeah. I think he looked at it as sort of being housekeeping for us, changing, changing That's that. a big house, yes. Yeah. the city out of that and taking our name out of the community. Um, and 7618 that involves the city clerk is just taking us, taking our name out of it. Out of that. Out of that <laughs> ordinance. And then 12815 animal control officer. Um, Yeah, it's taken under. Not that we've had any. No, we've, we've never had a street light fall on someone's <laughs> cow <laughs> or a chicken or something. And then 128.16 um, is dealing with reimbursement. Yeah, that's the same thing. So, do you wish to. Uh, can you all these to the tent? Yeah. Please, the solicitor to appear in person. Especially since this is coming on the recommendation of this committee, and I would recommend these, you know. So, that's a motion to continue to the tent? Okay, with a request for our solicitor to be here to answer questions. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. That takes us to the end of the ordinance agenda. And we have a joint meeting with the planning board posted in seven minutes or so. So I'm going to call a short recess until the planning board members join us, and then we will reconvene and open our joint public hearing. All right? Is everyone comfortable with that? So a short seven minutes or so recess. And all right, good evening. The, uh, the Ordinance Commis Committee is back in session after a short recess, and we're here to open a joint public hearing with the Planning Board. I'm City Councilor David Murphy. I chair the City Council Ordinance Committee. With me are City Councilor Maureen Carney and Jesse Adams. The Planning Board is also here, and I think uh, I wanted to announce to, to everybody that we're not only having minutes taken and audio recording, but we are having the North Street Association video this and NCTV televised this. So we have complete and ultimate coverage of our meeting tonight. So could I get the uh, planning board members to introduce themselves? And then else? Carla Youngblood, Ann Brooks, John Luck, Devin Bruce, Randy Gardner, and Carolyn Mish is here. Mm -hmm. From the planning staff, and Mary Medora is here, and she's staff to the City Council Ordinance Committee. Um, so we're here to deal with several changes in the zoning ordinance, um, and what I think I'll do to begin with is, is go to the public and see if the public has any specific opening comments they want to make. I think what 
that, that some of the changes are consistent throughout, but I might suggest if anyone wants to make an opening comment now, you're welcome to. And then what we'll do is have uh, Carolyn present each one of these ordinances and allow you, allow you to comment if you want to be specific to one of those ordinances, comment when we're actually talking about that ordinance that we'll let you do that as well. So is there anybody that wants to make a general comment now before we get going? Okay, uh, we'll, we'll start off with you, sir. Hey, come on up to the podium and give us your name so we can, right. we can hear you. The microphone will pick you up. Right. Name Richard, and address. Richard Green, 88 Round Hill Road. Uh, I'd like to urge that the ordinance changes, at least in principle, be submitted to a referendum rather than decided uh, from top down. I, I know that this is in an effort to implement the uh, vision, the um, sustainability plan, sustain, uh, sustainable Northampton plan. Uh, I doubt from a large number of people I've spoken to that people really understood or anticipated the kinds of consequences that this might have. The <clears throat> wholesale nature of the changes proposed in the ordinance could result in much greater density uh, than uh, people would like in their settled, established neighborhoods. It would open the door to uh, exploitation. I don't want to say exploitation. It would open the door to opportunities for developers to come in and increase uh, density substantially. The supposed purpose is to allow people already there to expand their houses, but it's not limited to that. It isn't a discretionary procedure. There are no criteria applied to uh, applications for uh, expansion of a number of units on a piece of property. Uh, so I want to uh, urge that the, the ordinance board, I'm not sure who's, who, what board is responsible for this, give serious consideration to uh, a public referendum where the consequences of this are explained, people have an opportunity to understand it and express their opinion on it. The, the process is that uh, there are two, there's a board, the planning board meeting here tonight, the ordinance committee meeting here tonight. We would then both make recommendations to the city council and then the city council would be the one to vote on the zoning change. So these two committees would weigh in, then the council would weigh in, but nothing would happen until after the council weighed in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. I, I had a chance to give my comments uh, at the, the other subcommittee meeting where this was considered. I just don't, I just wanted to say, I don't know if it's relevant, but there are five city councilors here, so that, that, which constitutes a, a quorum of the council. Uh, I just didn't, I just wanted to let everyone know that. Yes, for folks at home, the Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels is in the audience tonight, and Councilor Marianne Lodge is in the audience tonight, though so they're not members of the Ordinance Committee, which is what's meeting here. And just to let everybody know, um, because of proposed changes that came out of the uh, Economic Development and Land Use Committee, that both the Planning Board and the Ordinance Committee are ultimately going to continue this to the next meeting so that those changes could be advertised and comment could be made on those proposed changes. So. No, no votes will be taken tonight except to continue this public hearing, I think, by both bodies until their next meeting. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. My name is Adam Cohen. I live on North Street. I understand that Edlu recommends that special permits be required for developments of seven units or more. I support this, and I encourage you to lower the special permit threshold to five units. Larger developments have often been controversial it seems clear that residents want more input into these proposals, not less. It serves the purpose of smart growth to accommodate this. When residents are ignored, when big, ugly projects spring up next to them, you can't blame them for wanting to sprawl out to the suburbs, using large lots to insulate themselves from adverse change. The new, now, this new zoning is not simply about ratifying neighborhoods that were laid down a century ago. For most people today, cars give them critical access to jobs, shopping, and resources in the region. Scarce parking is already an issue on some streets downtown and in Florence Center. The final report of the Zoning Revisions Committee called for no change in the off-street parking requirements in URA, B, and C 
with respect to one to four family homes. These requirements are one space per 500 square feet for each unit. By contrast, the proposal before you calls for one space per 1,000 square feet of gross living area. So in some cases, it would appear that the off-street parking requirement would be cut by as much as half. This is overly aggressive. It would be better to reduce the off-street parking requirement gradually over a period of years so the process could be paused if problems arise. More generally, I'd be reassured if I felt the city was advancing the pro-resident parts of the Sustainable Northampton plan with as much zeal as the pro-developer parts. In particular, we need more attention to expanding the tree canopy in the infill receiving areas. To me, this means measuring this canopy by ward every year, passing a significant tree ordinance to protect the city's old and large trees, protecting the trees that currently buffer properties, and committing to planting a specific number of new trees every year. Thank you. Um, does anyone else wish to make a general, yes, general comment? My name is Deb Jacobs. I live at 82 Grove Ave in Leeds. I was uh, a member of the uh, Sustainability Committee. And I think one of the challenges that you uh, face is when you take a piece out of a larger um, plan, you have to make sure that because it's an early an early piece that you're dealing with, that you don't um, knock out some of the other ideas. Because with every plan, you can't do everything <coughs> that, that you want to do. And I'll give you an example. Um, tree canopy versus solar. Do you plant large trees and then people can't have solar? I mean, there are just these little conflicts. Um, and I think you really need to look at this um, rezoning um, in, in, in the context that it comes from. Thank you. Anyone else for a uh, yes, please? <clears throat> Claudia Lesko, 40 Valley Street. Just to back up on what Deb said, 40 Valley Street, for people who don't know, <clears throat> is at the edge of the city, then comes Henry Street, and then are the meadows out there. And so we're a downtown neighborhood, but we are at the edge of the city. And I think one of the challenges around the zoning and the, the, sustain, the vision plan for how this is all going to go down is that we are an urban area in a rural setting. And so on some level, uh, developing developing downtown, you know, what is the downtown where I live on Valley Street, I think is considered downtown. And our particular concern has to do with Henry Street, which is the last street before you get to the meadows. And on the edge of Henry, on, on Henry Street, on one side are these very, very deep lots that go back to the dike. And so we're facing this possibility that if you reduce the frontage, and people have these very deep lots, they could build a lot of houses there. And so you start to bring the urban environment into the what is like this nice rural surrounding. And so, you know, we are very concerned about how that is going to go down. And it's very specific, I think, to Henry Street, although I don't really know if there's other places in the city, but the lots are very deep. And we, you know, we fall into an urban, you know, zoning area. So I'm very concerned about this. My name is Linda Rom from 52 Olive Street. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank everyone for the time and effort that has been put into this project. I think people smarter than I have definitely um, concentrated on the best part of Northampton here. It's been a long time in coming, a little bit longer than I would like, but I wanted to support this whole process because I feel that it brings back the neighborhoods back to how they were intended. I, in my particular case, can build this big monstrosity, which I don't want to, but it's the only way to build in my area. I would like to see the neighborhoods go back to the way they were and allow single families and single family communities, allow multifamilies and, and condos in the areas where they were intended to be. And with that said, I appreciate all the work you've done. Thank you. There was another question over in this seat, please. Janet Gross, uh, 38 Round Hill Road. 
I have attended a number of meetings dealing with this issue. Some of you have heard me express my concerns before. You realize I'm sure that I am a person who is rather opposed to the systems of modernism. Um, at one of the meetings I attended, an individual um, on the planning board said, I don't think we yet made the case for these zoning regulations and sustainability. And I agreed. And I still feel that the case has not been made. Uh, following the meetings I've attended, I tend to look things up about sustainability and density. And um, one of the things that I <coughs> see lacking in the plan is any reference to green building. It seems to me if this is all about sustainability, then the new construction should be green construction. It, um, you know, I also find it rather ironic that there's all this discussion of people walking to town, yet at the same time, we are creating more and more car dealerships on King Street. Um, and they can be any kind of car dealerships, not simply um, energy efficient cars. Um, you've, I've also made comments about um, how these zoning regulations will contribute to the degradation of historic houses, historic neighborhoods. You see that's happened all throughout Northampton. And, um, you know, it's, it's very sad. Um, the sustainability plan from which this all comes is now six years old. I was not here when it was prepared. I have read it, but it was a few years ago. I think the plan needs to be reviewed, not mindlessly followed. Um, it is not carved in stone. Things change. Um, and I would agree with Dick Green that because this um, zoning ordinance affects virtually everyone in Northampton, that it should be put into a referendum. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else wish to make a general comment? Again, you'll have a chance to comment on each of these relative to their zones if you're specifically interested in one of those zones. Right. I don't see any more hands, so. Let's have Carolyn, would you move forward with amend 350A and 350B table of use with regards to URA? Sure. I think if it's okay with the boards, um, I'd like to give an overview of sort of how we got here. And, and, and in that regard, to take all of these ordinances um, in a package, but then run through the details. The details of each. Yeah. Okay. Um, so um, this is the, the proposed ordinances in front of you deal with uh, a, a approximately two-thirds of where the residential or the residents in Northampton um, live now. So the dark green is urban residential A, um, the yellow is urban residential B, and then this purple area and um, bits up here our residential, urban residential C, and I'll go into more details of what, what um, neighborhoods those, those comprise, but this is generally Leeds, and then we've got Florence Center here, and so we've got this big area of urban residential B around um, Florence Center, and um, coming all the way down into Northampton, surrounding the urban residential C area, which is right around downtown Northampton. Um, and I just did a quick listing of the, um, by ward, the different districts that are um, within each of the wards. So virtually every ward has a bit of this, I would say. Um, ward 6 is just a tiny bit of urban residential A here that this um, zoning affects. And uh, again, the zoning packages uh, relate to um, the tables. Generally, the tables of use and the tables of dimensions are two different tables in our current zoning ordinance. And so the proposal is really to merge those and, and within those tables have approximately 80 to 90 percent of all the information that you would need to know about your neighborhood where you live based on the zoning 
in that one table. So that's part of, of the change. Um, and going into more details of the goals for the changes for all the districts <coughs> is to match zoning to the existing neighborhoods, um, which then would eliminate many non-conforming aspects of properties that are in these districts. And when I say non-conformities, I mean that there are parcels that are um, smaller or have less setback um, or less open space than what the current zoning um, requires. And when you have non-conformities, it's an indication that the policy ob objective of the community is to ultimately get rid of those nonconformities and make sure and, and um, essentially uh, modify the neighborhoods to match the zoning. So e what you're making a statement saying that um, um, ultimately the nonconformity should go away, property should merge, and we should have bigger lots to match what the zoning is. Um, the changes in this uh, proposed zoning would also create flexibility for, for family structure, unit structure. If you have a non-conforming two-family and you buy it and you really want to expand into the entire structure, you could never go back to a two-family again um, <clears throat> if it's a non-conforming um, lot or, or structure. Um, the, another goal is to encourage preservation of historic homes by allowing reinvestment of <coughs> And by historic homes, I don't mean designated as historic um, structures per se, but I mean older um, homes that make up the fabric and character of a neighborhood that um, by um, renovation and rehabilitation of structures is very costly and to offset that cost of major rehab um, um, by incorporating a new apartment unit or an accessory unit um, could help in the preservation of those homes. At the same time, there was a lot, there's been a lot of discussion over the years about uh, trying to maintain those neighborhood characters of those, those older neighborhoods. And um, as I mentioned previously, another goal is to really simplify the ordinance, make it easy to understand what's, what your neighborhood is all about, what their criteria are, and that happens also by merging these two tables into one, so you can just go to one place and find out most of what you need to know about your neighborhood. I'm not going to go through the details of the process, but this is really, um, we've got to the, the ordinances in front of you today. We started the discussion well before 2005, but um, the sustainable planning process took a couple of years, which was followed up by a, a study committee to look at changes to the regulations. And the way the city has, um, had taken the task of implementing the sustainable residential plan was incrementally, taking bits at a time instead of, uh, you know, another way you could do it is hire an outside consultant to look through the whole thing and um, submit a big binder saying, here's your new ordinance, um, essentially. And, and that's a very costly way to do it. So we felt like we would take it um, a step at a time. So there's lo there have also been lots of other studies that have happened since Sustainable Northampton that was fed into this. And last September, we had draft regulations that we took out um, for public comment, and based on that public comment, um, the planning board made um, some substantial changes to what you have in front of you now to try to address those concerns of the residents. Um, just some brief data points. Population has been relatively flat since 1960, so what that means is, and in particular as it relates to per person, uh, persons per household, so our size requirement for units has changed and there's a demand for smaller units and, and mm -hmm. we can't do that within the structures that we have. So we might have these large homes that are single or two, two family units, but in fact the demand is really for smaller units, but you can't then create more units within those large structures under the current zoning. Um, and I want to go briefly over some um, non-conforming aspects and some changes that relate to sustainability. Um, we have, within those, these three districts, 60 plus percent of the units do not comply. And I'm going to go into details when we go into each of those districts about, about what some of those neighborhoods look like. Um, and so again, we're saying that these neighborhoods aren't valuable because they're not complying. This happens to be Walnut Street, and as you can see, the red X's indicate all the lots that don't comply with the current zoning. Um, 
but yet all these neighbors, these neighbors are neighborhoods are all very high value, and so if you don't have zoning that matches that, you're basically saying this is not the way you want the neighborhood to look. Maybe every other house should go away because that's um, that would be more um, conforming to the existing zoning. We also have done a housing analysis that shows uh, much um, greater demand than we realize for more affordable units, and we're not talking about just subsidized affordable units, we're talking about market rate affordable units, so people of all different, um, you know, in all different job types can afford to live in Northampton. We're not meeting that, um, those gaps. And the idea of allowing um, uh, more units close into services um, effectively reduces tr overall traffic patterns in the city. If you've got people who have the ability to connect to the things that they need to go to, schools and, and services, then, um, and you have housing uh, for people who want to get to those um, services, then you potentially can reduce um, through neighborhood traffic or people coming outside of the city who can't afford to live in the city, but still come for those services. Um, and really adjusting the zoning to reflect that historic um, development patterns that really have a mix of units throughout instead of the 1960s and 70s model where we clustered affordable units in this um, happens to be Hampshire Heights and we also hand in gardens. So we had this model um, in the 60s where we were really pushing different types um, of housing in one area, which is different than the pattern that developed since the beginning of Northampton, where you've got a mix of units in neighborhoods, singles, twos, by families, etc., um, of all different, um, to address um, people of all different income levels. Um, so I'll start with urban residential A and go into the details um, for those, um, for this district. <coughs> so again, this is um, sort of the core leads area, this big area of Look Park, so it's, um, nothing's really going to change there. Um, and then there's some urban residential aid north of um, Florence Center, um, Strawberry, um, Hill Fox Farms. And then um, this big slot here is, is Child's Park, just for reference. The Northampton um, Rail Trail bike path is here, Jackson Street School. Um, so this green area, and then there's little bits around here. This is Ward Avenue. There are, there's a little bit of urban residential A around um, Hillside, and then over here along um, Bain Road. So the proposed changes are to um, one uh, lot size to 5,000 square feet. It's currently 12,000 square feet and 50 feet of frontage and a reduction of open space slightly to 40%. To Still only uh, um, focusing on single family and accessory units. Um, at this time, which is what the current regulations allow. There's been some discussion about looking at possibly modifying that, but that's not in this proposal um, right now. And again, the details, which will be consistent throughout, are that there's one standard, a lot size standard, for different configurations of uses and, um, and structures. So, Urban residential A is primarily a single family residential district, but some other uses are allowed, um, cemeteries and, and other institutional uses, but the lot size standard would carry through for all those different types of uses. We've also instituted, um, and this is consistent with all the districts, some design elements to, that would apply to new construction that we've never had outside of the Elm Street um, district or in with historic commission review. And they're not meant, they're, they're not detailed design standards. The planning board was concerned about being too um, structured on what housing types people might want to um, build. But the idea is really about, more about form in the neighborhood to be consistent with other houses that are in that, in the block, in the neighborhood. Break up parking if there's more than, um, five parking spaces in a, in a, uh, on a parcel that it really needs to be of a neighborhood scale and neighborhood character. So you can't just have a big swath of parking in front of your residential unit. Um, and then a little more detail about attached garages and how, they're, how they um, have impacts to the neighborhood and how you can mitigate those impacts to the neighborhood. 
we have some of those currently on the um, in the zoning ordinance that just takes it a little bit further. Um, so just a little bit about how this affects urban residential A and some examples of, of non-conforming neighborhoods. Currently, only 65% of single-family homes in the urban residential A districts comply with the 12,000 square feet footlock requirement. Um, if the zoning were to pass, 99% um, of single-family homes would comply. You still have non-compliance with about 8% of the units because they're either 2, 3, or 4, or some other variable of, of uh, multifamily. And just an example, this is a neighborhood in Leeds. Um, the X's represent all the structures in this little snapshot that don't comply um, with the current zoning. Um, on the right-hand side is another urban residential neighborhood um, off of Elm Street. And all of these on this, along this street indicate lots that don't meet the current requirement. And they may not meet the frontage either, but this is just a snapshot of the lot size requirement and, and how um, out of sync the, the neighborhoods are with our, or our current zoning is with the neighborhoods. Um, an example of um, the proposed zoning and how that might look. This is Ridgewood Terrace off of um, Jackson Street, and many of these homes here have 50 feet of frontage and 5,000 5, to 7,000 square foot lot sizes. So we have examples of these neighborhoods and these high value neighborhoods, and, um, and so this is what um, a neighborhood might look like. So you might have um, the ability to create one or two additional single family house lots here where you have um, haven't been able to do that before, but again, it matches the character of that neighborhood. <coughs> um, urban residential B details. Uh, the yellow represents the B district. There's a little bit here in Leeds, and then again, surrounding Florence Center is right here. Uh, and then um, going all the way into, um, this is Elm Street Corridor here, this is the, um, the bike path um, uh, parallel to Prospect Street here, this is going out uh, Bridge Street, and then we have all of this area out off of South Street, um, and a little bit down here um, going out Earl Street and Grove. In the urban residential B, um, we have a proposal of 2,500 square feet per unit, which effectively for a single family really means 3,750 square feet because we do have a minimum depth requirement that we've carried over from the existing zoning. So um, that necessarily means that for a single family it'll be slightly larger than that. But once you go to a two family, um, you then would have 5,000 square feet. And um, we went to the per unit, we went back to the per unit lot size requirement based on public comment going back to September about concerns that there would be too much new possible new development in neighborhoods if there was just a flat lot size requirement. So going back to making sure that um, you've got enough land area or you have a little bit more land area with the number of units that you um, look at um, adding to your structure or lot. Did you say what it is currently? Um, currently, it's 8,000 square feet, um, and I'll go into that in the next slide, too, about the minimum lot size requirement. There's 8,000, it goes up to 12,000 for a two-family, 18,000 square feet for a three-family. So it goes up significantly more. Um, again, 50 feet of frontage um, for a lot, 40% open space, which is a slight drop from the 50%, and then a reduction in front setback from 20 feet to 10 feet. Um, mm -hmm. Many of the neighbor, uh, neighborhoods have um, structures that are less than 20 feet, and we have these complicated special permits that allow you to get closer if you can show that your neighborhood has um, structures in it. So this would eliminate that special permit criteria and just allow by <coughs> right what many people have gone through to, um, for special permits. Um, <clears throat> we've also looked at eliminating or allowing more than one principal structure on a parcel, which is zoning allows um, to happen. Um, and then again, one standard for all uses and then the same design criteria uh, carries through in all three districts. 
um, in urban residential B under the current zoning. 63% of the single family homes meet the 8,000 square foot minimum lot size requirement. 38% of the two families currently meet the 12,000 square foot lot requirement and 18% um, meet the three family for 21,000 square feet. Um, this is another example. This is uh, Maynard um, off the road off of Elm Street. All of these X's represent single and two families that don't meet the minimum lot size anywhere between 8,000 and 21,000 mm. square feet. So again, there, there are a mix of units in this neighborhood that all of these represent the um, lots that are out of sync. The proposed zoning would result in approximately 99% of the single families to comply. 92% of the two families and 76 of the three families. There would still be some number that would not comply because um, there's not a proposal at this time to add any more than three families. Three families currently the um, maximum, although if you did a townhouse um, bill <coughs> a permit, you could have more than three townhouses. Um, the proposal would, uh, still allows townhouse development um, so uh, again, um, that would require um, a uh, site plan approval for anything that's built more than two, that's not a single family home, that's more than 2,000 square feet automatically requires site plan approval. And I'll get to the details of a proposed amendment that was brought up at Edlu last week um, to institute a special permit criteria for seven or more townhouse units in the urban residential B and in urban residential C for multifamily or townhouse. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the thing that's going to be, um, that we need to advertise and we've advertised it for planning board May 23rd and um, we'll advertise for the June 10th ordinance committee meeting for that so that once you get, so if you had a big enough lot for a seven, um, seven units I guess that would mean you need um, 15, close to 20,000 square feet of lot areas. If you had that and you wanted to do seven townhouse units and you could still meet all the other criteria, that's what is proposed to be a special permit. Um, examples of how this might affect um, projects. Um, you could potentially add units within existing um, large houses. This happens to be on Elm Street that's... Um, I think Councilor Murphy mentioned there was around maybe 7,000, 6 or 7,000 square feet, but only two units are allowed by current zoning in there. And so it's a lot of upkeep on that um, tremendously large home to just be able to um, have two um, quite large individual units. So, and there's also a large carriage house. So the idea is to be able to preserve these um, beautiful old homes in the city, but also make it a little bit easier for people to maintain those by potentially adding units within them. Um, the lower picture, actually the property owner um, spoke earlier, I don't know if she's still here, but this is an example of sort of a, what we call a missing gap or a gap on a street. Um, if you were to look at an overview photo, there are houses, single family homes all along the street, and then this is a large parcel that doesn't have anything there. The applicant applied for a special permit for a two-family, but it has to be attached. So instead of creating a separate single-family house lot there, by current zoning, um, the only way to do it is by attaching it. So then it becomes this much bigger structure that doesn't quite fit in with the neighborhood that has um, these gaps between the units. Mm -hmm. So the zoning could um, address that by allowing these smaller in <coughs> Urban residential C is, um, we've got a few pockets um, north of um, downtown. Um, this is um, Hampshire Heights and, and Hampton Gardens, and then there's um, the Coach Light condominiums, and this is River Run. Otherwise, the only other urban residential C surrounds um, up downtown Northampton, goes up to Round Hill and around Kensington. Um, this is Lyman and Smith College. Um, properties here and um, out Market Street and Union Graves, those streets, and then down here along um, William Street, etc., um, down to this is the right here, the edge of the, edge of the district. 
Um, 2,500 square feet per unit, again, the same depth would carry forward for single family home, 50 feet of frontage and a 10 foot front and side setback. We found there was a lot of work done by the Zoning Revisions Committee and um, staff to look at all these figures and in urban residential C, we probably have the most non-compliance as it relates to um, setbacks between structures. So it's currently 15 feet on the side, so this is a this would allow people to modify their um, homes without always going to the county board for approval. Um, it also allows any mix of types of units. This is a district in which we allow um, a whole range of, of units and, and heights, multifamily as well as single family, twos, threes, etc. Um, but we have different criteria for different um, types of units. Some require special permits, others require site plan. For the most part, it's site plan, but it also varies. Um, so the same standard about more than one structure per lot would apply. And um, again, design standards. And, and here's where we, uh, I mean, one of the aspects about the public comment that was very beneficial, I think, was that um, there, you know, when you have multifamily, the, the issue about parking was, was raised and, um, and of a concern. And of course, when you have multifamily, you're dealing with adding more parking for those units. And so then the design really comes into play about how you address parking, but in a way that doesn't overwhelm the neighborhood or even that parcel. So we felt like it was important to add that. I will make a comment since it was raised at a public comment about how the parking requirement has um, been relaxed. So I want to explain a little bit that it, it's not, currently we have one parking space per 500 square feet of building and then you round up or down depending on if you're a half point towards more parking or less. And then we have additional parking for accessory units. So an accessory apartment can be 900 square feet. So you have one more parking space per 900 square feet. So that's the, what we changed. And, and again, we keep the, the maximum required parking would be two per unit. So that piece hasn't changed. Just the square footage within it to try to rationalize it more, given that in one scenario we were only requiring one parking space for a 900 square foot apartment, whereas in another scenario we would require two for a 900 square foot apartment. So um, there's a slight modification to this, but it also eliminates all the, the um, confusion about which way you round if you're, um, if you're required to do a partial space. There's no more rounding allowed. You just have one for... Um, um, I want to go a little bit of um, detail about the character of urban residential C. Um, this yellow outer ring represents that um, urban residential C, and there's the, there's the donut hole in the middle of central business. Um, the red represents a quarter mile walking distance on route from the central business. So it's on street walking, which is why you have, it's not a smooth buffer ring. Um, it's kind of jagged around the edges. The blue represents a half mile um, route, walking route to the central business district. So when we're talking about sustainability, the, the big, um, especially in town, for town centers, it's, um, people are drawn to walk when there's, when there's a, a, particularly for downtown, when there's, um, lots of vibrancy and access. So a quarter of a mile is definitely considered you know, walkable most of the time. Half mile is walkable, um, very walkable, and people will do it except in extreme circumstances. So we just, we looked at this because we wanted to see how it sort of matched the, the urban residential C boundary. It also had come up in discussion about what we should do about, as there was a concern raised about Henry Street, how, um, you know, it's at the edge of downtown. But this really, re here is um, Henry Street here, Valley Street. So well within the half mile distance of the current central business boundary. And just as, a, as an aside, we've been working at, um, from the start of this plan and even before at expanding central business down Pleasant Street. And you've seen the businesses expand and we've changed the district as those new business interests have come in on Pleasant Street. And the goal really is to extend that boundary um, down Cons and Pleasant. So as we go further down, these, these neighborhoods are going to be even closer to those services. 
Um, <coughs> in urban residential C, only 61% of the single family homes meet the current 6,000 square foot lot size requirement. 14% of um, the two families meet the 12,000 square foot lot requirement. 7% for three family, 5% for four family, and it goes on. I mean, we, the, there, there's many um, multifamily structures that are well beyond four, but the number just keeps dropping. <laughs> Um, and so you can see that um, that's been, I mean, this goes up quite a bit um, per unit, for the per unit count. Under the proposed zoning, would raise the single family compliance level up to 90%, 75% for two families, 46% still low on the low end for three and four families. And then again, I didn't do the calculation for the multifamily beyond five. Um, this is an example of an urban residential C neighborhood um, where um, this is actually Aldrich and Summer Street, and there's a mix of single families and multifamilies in this neighborhood. And these are all the um, lots that don't comply um, with the minimum lot size requirement. Um, and, uh, um, <laughs> Some examples in urban residential C. Um, this is Northampton, um, I'm sorry, the college, uh, college inn. Um, uh, and quite a large lot, quite a large structure right next to the central business district, but can't do more than, than what's there. There's seven rooms and then one apartment. Um, so with urban residential <coughs> to the URC would allow more um, smaller, units there, residential units right next to downtown. There's another example on um, Eastern Avenue where there's many attached units and some detached units along the street, but then you get this big gap. And there's nothing that the property owner has come several times to sort of evaluate what they can do with that um, street frontage property. So just an example about how you know, you might, a little bit of infill could um, um, provide new housing units close to town. Um, and so I'm just summarizing again, the idea is to look at the zoning and, and, and help to match the neighborhood in form and character. Um, the idea is to allow replication of those high neighborhood, uh, high value neighborhoods, um, as well as encourage sustainability, allow some um, amount of infill to address some of the housing demands but still preserve the character of the neighborhood um, and, and really reduce the pressure by allowing development throughout the city in small um, areas or small units at one unit at a time might reduce the pressure for um, creating large-scale projects in one neighborhood or another. Um, and then, um, again, I can explain what was um, the amendment that was proposed if anybody wants or any other questions. Very good. So what I'd like to do at this point is that we'll step to our discussion based on the zone. Some of the things are in common, but I know some of the public has specific interest in specific zones. So now that Carolyn's presented, does anybody want to make a comment specific to URA? We'll talk about that one first. Sure, please come up and just state your name. My name is Steph Jacobs, and two Grove athletes. And I live in URA up in Leeds. And I have to say, I could care less whether or not my house is on a um, non-conforming lot. Um, what interested me in, in the house was the availability of the school, um, that it was green. Um, it's a quirky neighborhood, lots of different types of houses, lots of different sizes of lots. And I feel like some of, I, I like some of the ideas that are um, presented in this, but I'm always a little, um, I'm a little hesitant to um, to want to see design um, standards. Um, there's a dorm up at Smith, right across from, pretty much across from John M. Green that's got a lot of glass. And when that first went up, it caused such a stink. People were so horrified by it was modern, it didn't fit in. And I'm sure nobody even notices it anymore. Um, I think you have to um, 
you have to encourage creativity. And it may not be what you personally like, what your taste is. But things change. I mean, I can remember thinking that solar panels were incredibly ugly. And why would anyone, you know, put that on their house? Um, I just think you have to go more for creativity and, and less for um, conforming. I don't want to live in Levittown. Um, and I don't particularly want to live on Walnut Street. Mm -hmm. But I, I just... I just think that it goes uh, just a little too far, and um, I, I, I see in my neighborhood people with large lots being able to sell off part of their lot, and there are a number of houses that have been, been put in in all the streets up there. Um, there's two in, in, in my name on my street <coughs> that used to be a meadow. There's uh, a couple of new ones up off of, um, one's on the corner of East, uh, East Center and one's um, on Upland. And, and, and people do this already with the current zoning. So I, I don't want it to go too far. Thank you. I, I like the design standards piece, actually. I'd like to see more of it and what I've seen some towns do is they provide an out for creativity by saying, if you follow our design standards, you get a quicker, easier approval process. If you want something special, then, then you need to go through something like a special permit process. So I think uh, certainly in, in my neighborhood, we've seen situations where people put up new stuff. And I think a, a modest application of design standards would have really helped those properties harmonize better with buildings around them, not at great cost to the developer. So um, I hope you don't lose the design standards piece. Um, and I'd like to see actually some more. Thanks. Any other comments specific? Seeing none, the committee discussion? elements being that the proposed zoning would allow most um, uh, lots and residents to then be conforming where they're presently non-conforming. Um, and we just heard one resident say that there, is there some reason that you might give why people might want to or might um, be concerned about whether their property is non-conforming that you might be able to yeah, I, I mean, I guess if you're if you're non-conforming, there are probably a couple um, different ways to look at it. One is, um, um, again, that means that the the interest is that at some point the lock becomes conforming by adding to it. Um, so if the prop the house is destroyed by natural disaster, tornado, or what have you, and couldn't rebuild within the statutory allowance for two years for whatever reason, um, you know, that's extinguished. You can't go back. Um, if you happen to have a two family down, I mentioned before, and you, your change in status, <coughs> you wanted to go to a single family, but then later you needed more income, you can't go back to a two family. Um, the other piece of it is you all, um, to try to tie in other pieces that you guys have been looking at is that we recently changed the zoning uh, to, con to be consistent with court cases relative to non-conforming structures. And so to the extent that you have a lot of non-conforming um, structures that enable people to come and add in any way, despite what the zoning says, like for instance, for setbacks. Um, so essentially, the more non-conforming structures you have on a parcel, the more it opens it up to an unknown um, in terms of the possibility of people adding closer to their side lot lines to their neighbors, eating up more open space. Um, so those are sort of a couple of reasons. I have a couple questions. Um, under A, uses allowed by right. Um, do you now allow attached accessory units by right, or is that a permit? Yes. No, so that is not a change. Right. 
How about home business up to 25 visits a yes, week? That's, right. that's now what that's currently allowed, yes. Okay. Now, site plan <coughs> approval required for the following. That's new, is it not? As it is? Um, no. We have site plan approval, um, and I can actually uh, pull up the, uh, the standards and look at them. Um, there's a list. We currently, uh, all of these um, are currently allowed um, as a site plan approval. Any new construction that's not a single family um, is, a, is required now for, to be site plan approval. Um, the educational use um, is um, usually site plan approval because of the standards for uh, parking for that school. <laughs> when you're building a new school, you're typically going to be over 2,000 square feet anyway, so that triggers site plan. So this just says site plan. We want to see it no matter what. Right. Um, Even if it's used permitted by right in that zone. Right. If it's not a single family, it needs site plan. Right. If it's over 2,000 square feet. Right. So site plan is a technical standard to make sure you're addressing egress, you know, landscaping, lighting, um, any traffic mitigation that might be required. Uh, not about the use and whether the use is allowed. And then just a, just a general <coughs> question um, for, for planning board, because uh, and the speakers addressed this, design, this is the first time design standards have meandered their way into the zoning ordinance. Why, why did you recommend that? What was the compelling reason for doing that? Because that really is the first time we've seen them there. <laughs> well, I think uh, I'll start it off and the board members can, can um, feed into it. There was a lot of comment, there's a, been a lot of concern all along about the impacts of new development in neighborhoods and what that looks like. And so, um, so we started out with sort of a discussion about how detailed those design standards could be, and in fact, to address the concern about whether it's too detailed or not detailed enough. One of the reasons why there are no pictures, per se, of what your house needs to look like is the planning board felt very uncomfortable about dictating architectural style. The point of it wasn't to dictate architectural style, but more form. And so, how do those, so the design standards are really more about um, massing and scale, um, and less so about the type of architecture that is desired, and where the, where the pieces of the structure fit on the parcel and within the neighborhood. But that's sort of what the examples tend to be with nice rectangles. And right, well, I think, you know, Actually, as staff, I presented something that had sort of general um, house layout, and the board pretty uniformly, I think you all can speak to it, said, no, we don't want to influence what people, or, or to suggest what people might want, because what if someone wants to build a modern house? We don't want to, we don't want to impinge upon that creativity. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, the, the lots are nice <laughs> rectangles. Right. You know? And uh, there's many instances in North you, you could conform with the well, lot size requirement that's true. and have something that looks like a Massachusetts congressional district. Um, <laughs> yes. That would make it a little bit harder of a graphic to create. To, simply yeah. the so the, do you think there would be an impact of the design standards on that, or do you think we could? Uh, yes. <laughs> I would answer you that we think we've done it just as lightly as we can. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, the neighborhoods do take on a look, and this is a way to say we'd like for you to into the neighborhood, but you can do so with a great deal of flexibility. Okay, so it was compelling enough to do, but not compelling enough to make too strict. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I would just add, too, if you, I think everybody can, can relate to this, is there's not probably any one neighborhood that has um, uniform type of structures <coughs> on any one street. There, it's very, North Hampton is very eclectic neighborhoods in that regard. There's one story, it's a few stories, different st styles. So I think in any, it would be very difficult to go with much more detail. Mm -hmm. And I saw one other hand back there. Was that a question relative to URA? 
You've got to you've got to come up though so that we can incorporate you <coughs> in the TV show and hear you. Oh. Yeah, my name is Merle Warman. I guess I, I have a lot of trouble with the idea of reducing the lot sizes so greatly from 8,000 to 3,000. And I'd like to put this to a vote of the city members who probably aren't even aware of what you are A, B, or C they happen to be in. And I think that um, to make legislation that, or to make rules that will so affect the city, um, when I see that I don't see that many people who will be asking for these kinds of changes, and I can only wonder if this serves the real estate interests in the city rather than the people who live in the city and care about the city. <laughs> So, any other questions relative to URA? Any more discussion here before we move on to B? Seeing none. Anyone who specifically wants to comment about URB changes, and I would ask that they be specific to B and not just a regurgitation of general comments on A. Hi, again, I am Linda Ron from 52 Olive Street. Um, I wanted to make um, a clarification. I did not come to the planning board asking to build a two-family home. I came to the planning board to ask to split my lot that has 120 square uh, foot frontage and was told that I wasn't able to do that. So I came back to the planning board and said, if the only thing I'm capable of doing is building a two-family or a three-family or a four-family or a five-family, make a mass of condos, then can I ask not to have it be that I have to have so much of it attached to make it look so out of place for the neighborhood. In my neighborhood area, the history is frontages of 45 to 60 in the front. I had 120 and wasn't able to split that. As it is, I'm going to have to build this connection between the homes where everyone around me is a single family home. And I, <clears throat> I think that the changes that you are being proposed are very good for URB in the sense that it keeps the single families there or small additions without having to put these massive buildings on the lot. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say. And I think, you know, from a parking and, and all the, the form, I, I respect that as opposed to putting, you know, all the garages in the front or etc. and ruining the look of the neighborhood. I respect that form part as opposed to controlling the design part. Any other comments specific to URB changes? Okay. See none uh, discussion up here at all on that? Just to remind everybody, this was sponsored by the planning board, so most of these guys are real comfortable with what's here because they're the sponsors of it, so that's why there isn't a lot of any discussion from I have one question. Zero lot line single family. Is that new to B? That is not new. It's allowed in urban residential B and C. And um, it was initially created to allow a little bit more flexibility, uh, particularly with um, affordable housing construction so that people could own their own homes but have separate property boundaries. And uh, given the demand um, and the, cost, the demand for um, lower cost housing and the, um, the um, cost savings for attaching structures, the planning board um, felt like that should, be, that should be maintained. We haven't seen a lot of that, have we? We have um, actually mostly seen it as a way to reduce the frontage because currently, if you do a zero lot line, you don't have 75 feet of frontage, you can do 65 feet of frontage. So people haven't necessarily built homes attached but they've done it so that they, instead of having 150 feet on their lot, they could go to um, 130 feet and split the lot, and the houses would still be slightly separate. So they're not attached, but the, the sidelines are Smaller. more compact yes. than they would need to be. Yes. Okay, so you don't see you don't see absolute zero, but right. you see shorter than we're... Right. We've seen some, but we probably see more people who are using it as a way to reduce the frontage because it fits within the neighborhood. And 
Any other questions here about the... All right, so we'll move to URC. Any public comments specific to URC? Please. Hello, my name is Jim Nash of 18 Montview in Ward 3. During my time on the Zoning Revisions Committee, I heard a common theme from the citizens of Northampton. People were open to infill development as long as the character of their neighborhood would remain unchanged. Citizens were generally okay with neighbors adding a room, an apartment, subdividing a large home, even building on an empty lot. However, many people voiced a worry that easing our zoning regulations would invite projects that, that did not fit our neighborhoods. More specifically, multi-unit developments shoehorned into lots without regard to neighborhood layout. This proposed UR, UR zoning package provides insufficient safeguards around the design and dimensions of multi-unit developments. Furthermore, should this pr proposal pass as written with decreased frontage requirements, the number of infill opportunities for multi-unit developments will increase markedly. Controversial developments <coughs> such as that which polarized the North Street neighborhood will soon be coming to neighborhoods throughout the city. You have un undoubtedly heard the analogy that our current zoning would not allow us to build infill models like Cherry Street or Graves Avenue as they are today. This is true. But it is also true that the zoning proposal before you falls well short of this goal as well. Were Graves Avenue an empty lot of 2.5 acres, no developer would be required to create the public street we enjoy today. So what will we get? In Ward 3, we live with the results of lax design and streetscape regulations. We have multi-unit developments with no sidewalks that face parking lots and driveways, that have backyards where the side yard should be, that have front yards that face neighbors' backyards, that have homes on one side of the street and a wood fence or retention basin on the other. Mm -hmm. Where public space ends and private space begins <coughs> is anyone's guess. This is poor urban design. We know this, and yet this package does not regulate, regulate it. It promotes it. There is much to like in these proposals. The majority of UR property owners, those who own one to four family homes, will enjoy greater latitude with their investments. However, moving forward with this zoning package without inserting strong regulations for multi-unit developments is a breach of the public trust from when the infill discussion began, that our neighborhoods would be protected. In this zoning package, I find such gay safeguards severely lacking and ask that you do not approve them as written. Um, any other public comment? Please come, come on up and yeah, come on, state your name. I'm not in the best of shape, so I'm sorry here. Um, I, I would just like to first thank... Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Linda Murley, and I own uh, 90 Pomeroy Terrace, which is in URC. Um, it's a, I bought it uh, about two and a half years ago. It's a six-family property, um, and I'll give you a little bit of the background on that in a second, but I, I do want to just be really upfront and say I think this is a wonderful package. I think you've done a great job. Um, I'm, I'm one of those real estate people. I'm an architect, I'm a designer, I have my own business and have for 15 years. Um, my husband is also an architect, he works at UMass. Um, I, am, I am, I hesitate to use the D word, but I'm a developer in the sense that I buy the properties that I work with, so I put my own money behind them, and I do it exclusively in Northampton. Um, I do only small properties. 
small properties in these lovely neighborhoods that have fallen on hard times. I've done four properties, Pomeroy is the fourth, over the last five years. Um, when I purchased Pomeroy Terrace, it was uh, in not very good shape inside. Um, it had been six rental units for a very long time. There had been quite a bit of police activity there, I guess I could say. <coughs> um, it's a lovely neighborhood. It's, the property butts up against the dike, um, down below the dike. The property has a history of some pretty severe flooding because of a clogged um, sewer drain there and sewer main. And I bought it with the purpose of renovating it to preserve the beautiful old home. It had originally been built, I was told when I purchased it, it was built in 1930 um, and, then, and it was a girls school. And it was indeed part of the girls school in that part of Northampton for some years. But I found out later, um, I bought it from the Kahn's family. And Mr. Kahn's brother, uh, Mr. Kahn's, lives just across the street and is a lovely old man. He came over to talk to me about the property, as did some other neighbors, and gave me some more history that he could actually uh, validate. It actually was built in 1900 as a, as a family mansion, and the original carriage house was still there as well. And then it became a girls' school, and then it became a rental in the 70s. What I've done is renovated each of the units. It's a little over a half acre, so it's quite a large property for that close into the city. Uh, that would translate into, pro I think it's about 27,000 square feet of property. Uh, it is still non-conforming with six units um, at the current zoning, uh, 6,000 square feet per unit. I believe we could only have four units there. And the house, the old mansion in which the six units exist, is on one corner of the property. So the other two-thirds or three quarters, two thirds of the property are open. There's trees, there's parking, and a large part of it faces the, the back of Pomeroy. It has street frontage on three sides. And unfortunately, because that isn't, there's nothing there, even though there's this six family house, there's a lot of activity that shouldn't be going on there. There's, uh, because of the dike and the trees, um, I've had problems when we've had porta potties there, dirty needles left. Um, you know, lots of debris and beer cans. So I, I want to point out from a practical perspective, from my perspective, I'm not one of those developers that makes, you know, half a million dollars on my properties. I do them because I'm trained as an architect in urban design and in cities just like this. Um, they're hard to build from scratch now. So a really a valuable resource. And in that neighborhood in particular, it struck me that everything around Pomeroy Terrace, with the exception of Mr. Kahn's house, did not meet current zoning. It could not have been built. <coughs> the houses were actually far more dense. The density there is far greater than could be built under the current, current zoning, even under some of the new zoning changes. So yeah. I, I want to make sure that, that somebody voices the fact that actually Northampton is a very densely built city, and that's part of why it's so charming. There is enough activity here, there are, there are enough people that live here that they can support the businesses financially so the businesses can exist and thrive. There's sort of a, an interaction that has to occur. So I, I think from, you know, my personal opinion is that these changes don't necessarily increase density, they sort of rectify uh, the density that already exists and make it legal. What I've seen, um, because there's so many illegal units, or non-conforming units, I guess is a better word, um, lots of times people own those and they don't take care of them. So the, the rental market has a lot of, you know, really not very nice rental units here because the value doesn't exist in the property because it's non-conforming. So putting money into renovating those units doesn't make sense to people that own them. So that's one practical consideration. And the other one is, as I mentioned, sometimes these, I, I'm not sure, I think, Carolyn, you mentioned that they were uh, gaps in streetscapes. They can often be, in a, in a dense city, they can often be problem areas. Sometimes they're just gaps, and sometimes it's nice to have a green space. But in the case of areas like Pomeroy, it actually becomes a trouble spot, a, a, a place where you don't really want people to hang out on your property and do the things that they might do, but that happens anyway because there's not enough eyes on it because it's a blank space. 
So I just, I just would like to say again, thank you for. Um, I think the, the, um, the efforts that have gone into this are great. I think it's wonderful that there's been so much public commentary uh, enabled, in, so that people's opinions are really heard. And um, I think it's going in the right direction. So I'm a real estate person, but I'm. I'm a good real estate person. <laughs> I've never built 100 units. I'm never going to. I'm only going to do one or two. And, and I guess I'll close with saying that if these zoning changes go into effect, at Pomeroy, at 27,000 square feet, at New York City, 2,500 a square foot, technically, there could be eight or more units built, probably about 10. Um, and that would be about right for that property. It would retain the character of the houses across the street on all the sides. Um, and it would take care of that gap in the streetscape. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, other comments on uh, This isn't a strict BC, but I guess nothing has been strict. Uh, but it certainly applies to C. I live in C, Richard Green, 88 Round Hill Road. Um, there, there have been, this is a very complicated subject, there have been pro and con arguments. Uh, they're not necessarily addressed to the same points. There are some good things about the regulations, there are some the pro uh, zoning regulations, there are some questionable things about them. The problem is that you're going from a rigid restrictive system to a rigid system not entirely rigid, but too rigid, that opens the door to exploitation. You have responsible developers and real estate people, but they're not all that way. Property owners or developers can be more interest, more concerned about their own interests than they can be about the public interest. Um, let me address one argument that has been made as an example of, of bad argument. There are good arguments and there are bad arguments. The notion that you're going to reduce traffic by increasing density. Now, I, I live on top of Round Hill. I walk a lot. I walk downtown every time weather permits and I'm not in a hurry for any reason. I also walk to stop and shop if I want a little bit of shopping. But the distance isn't the only factor there. You have a steep hill. Uh, I do not do much shopping at Stop and Shop, although it's probably less than a mile from my house, because I've tried driving <coughs> a, car, a um, grocery cart up that hill, and it's bad for my back. It's hard. I've tried pushing it. I've tried pulling it. It doesn't work, so I don't do that anymore. And I don't like to have to walk down there to shop three or four times a week. I go once every five days or so in my car, and I do my shopping. A lot of stuff is that way. When you put more people in an area, there are going to be more cars. The, the possibilities of walking and biking aren't going to offset that, particularly given the topography of, of uh, this part of the city, a part of the part of the city that I'm, I'm talking about. You're going to have more parking. Uh, you're going to have people who may walk to the grocery store, although there aren't too many uh, there aren't many housing units very close to the stop and shop. Uh, but you're going to have people who need to go to work in their car, who need, want to go to uh, Route 1, who are going to doctor's offices, and so forth and so on. It's going to increase density of traffic. It's going to change. We're already seeing that happening. It's going to change the character of neighborhoods. Now, part, a large part of the attractiveness of the, of the part of the city that I'm in, and many other parts, apart out from Round Hill Road to Florence, is space, greenery, openness, uh, lawns instead of parking places, trees, a lot of big old trees. It has a suburban character. Some people in planning object to that. They say it's a city, it shouldn't be suburban. That's part of the attractiveness. Uh, we wouldn't have moved here if it weren't like it uh, was. We came from Amherst where they've got some problems with uh, university students, but uh, we, were, we were attracted to Northampton because of this openness and greenery. Uh, I'm afraid that these one size fits all, that's not the right description, that it, lack of discretionary power over 
the types of changes that are about to occur, which would result from these regulations, it seems to me, uh, would endanger significant changes in the character of the city, and not for the better. Some change is better. Some things need to be done. Some things need to be provided by regulations. There are others that I think the planning board uh, should take a second look at and, and say, all right, this makes sense. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I did say earlier that I thought this should be submitted to a referendum. That's a, that's a fallback position. If the, if the regulations could be more uh, neighborhood character friendly, I wouldn't see a necessity of that. But now I see a set of regulations that endanger the character of the city that we and a lot of other people uh, bought into. Thank you. Other C comments? Yes. Yeah. Are we doing URC? You need, you need to come up if you're going to comment and stand at the podium so we can see you and hear you. My name is Nick Bruce. I live and in just let us know who you are when you get here. Are we doing URC or can we do other things? U well, URC. URC. appreciate it if you did URC because mm -hmm. we've already talked about A and B. Okay. But if they're generic it, to all of them, then you can. Uh, my question is, and I don't understand, not, not every neighborhood it has one letter, right? There's some neighborhoods that are URA, some URC, but some neighborhoods have multiple letters, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, URB and no. URC or URA. It depends URB. on how you define a neighborhood, but. Yeah, so my question is, in, the, in those neighborhoods, which ordinances will apply? And I, I have uh, another question, and that is, what if you have a house that's 100 years old? Is that going to be grandfathered, or is the zoning, uh, the past practice will disappear if the zoning goes through? And I have <coughs> a, another question, and my question is, what does the five, what is the implication of a 5,000 square feet. Suppose someone has a lot that's um, 5,500 square feet. What's going to happen with the 500 feet? Is the city going to let them do that, or are they going to snatch the property? I mean, okay, those are my questions. You like Carolyn address those? Well, these are. Um, I'll start with the last one first. But these are minimum lot standards. So you need a minimum of 5,000 square feet, for example. <clears throat> If you have 5,500, then you have 5,500. It means you can't have two single-family homes in the A district. It means you have one, and it's 5,500 square feet. Um, and some neighborhoods do have different um, residential boundaries, as we think we saw on the map. It, um, uh, you know, the Brownsville neighborhood is a good example, where there's urban residential C, B, and a little bit of A. Um, obviously, so whatever, whatever, right, whatever, parcel. wherever your parcel is located, we're not proposing at this time any map changes. So on the table is just the dimensional changes for each of the districts, <coughs> no mapping um, changes. All right. Um, any other questions relative to C, please? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. My name is Mac Everett, and I'm a resident of 40 Valley Street. Uh, my wife spoke a little bit earlier, and I'm going to echo some of her concerns. Um, yeah, we're, we're crowded down there, down there in URC. Um, we've got a lot of dense housing, and um, I think we're pretty sensitive about the idea of multifamily development, although I would like to compliment you on your particular <laughs> renovation project. I think it's been a real asset to take some an older piece of housing and do a terrific job uh, renovating that and making it in, into really a great place for folks to live. There have been other developments, other infill developments in our neighborhood that have not felt that way and I think still feel like they're not totally in keeping with the integrity of the neighborhood. Um, and so we're wary of that. Um, and going back to the <coughs> issue of Henry Street that my wife talked about a little bit earlier, um, I'd just like to add to her comment that that whole, the dike has become sort of an impromptu greenway in Northampton. And a lot of people really value that as a recreational resource. There's a steady stream of people who are residents of these crowded areas and looking for green space to recreate in that use that as, as a, 
a great walk after work or in the morning or whatever. And I think the value of that is tremendous. Um, so, you know, the idea again of, and, and those properties that border up against the dike, really they've been traditionally, most of them have been small farms. And, you know, we're in an area where we're trying to preserve farms, we're trying to grow food locally and so forth. And I think that's another way to look at those properties besides being places where we can add lots of housing. So uh, I wanted to add my concern to that. Um, uh, and also, just, just a little reminder, when we talk about walkability and, and how these neighborhoods that are close to downtown are, uh, walkability is an important consideration. We have problems with walkability. We have a lot of, of areas in the ward where we either have no sidewalks or we have deteriorating sidewalks. So just to keep that in mind when we're talking about walkability. Um, we're also concerned, I think, in, in our neighborhood about, uh, very concerned about traffic in that we tend to have these fairly narrow roads. I don't know whether they're totally conforming or not, but they're narrow streets. And um, you know, any substantial addition of traffic is going to have a big impact. And of course, we all have an air quality problem in the valley here also, and that's a concern. So um, yeah, I, I just, like I say, I, I really feel like we're not necessarily, in, in those of us who are concerned in, um, in our particular part of the city are not necessarily anti-development, but we're very cautious and we're very concerned, as Jim mentioned, about you know large-scale multifamily developments. Thank you. Uh, there, there was another, yeah, please, another hand on the My name is Kate Ewell, and I am um, a resident of Henry Street, the street that was being talked about some as well. Um, I live there with my husband and two very small children, and we scoped out Northampton for several years before we bought a house and we chose this neighborhood because it was mostly one and two families with a mix of older and younger people all using it in a very residential way um, with really not much large development style cookie cutter at all. Um, we can't see any of them when we walk around our neighborhood and that's what we love. There is one buried that nobody likes and nobody knows how to get in there and it's very off-putting and and, and these new regulations would change it so that every house on my entire street, on one side of the street, could develop 20, 30 units. Every single property, one after the other after the other, it would be just strips of these giant condos. And that's, that would destroy our neighborhood, add massive traffic, and really like just overshadow my entire world. It would be horrible. It would really do the opposite of everything that is being said. And this whole notion I just heard over and over again this whole notion that we need to make everything so it is conforming and change all these regulations so that they're conforming. But these regulations were put in place after these things were built, were put in when it was okay that most of these things were non-conforming. It wasn't like they got all this permits and that's how we got to these non-conforming situations. These regulations were put in so that the development would stop and we wouldn't have this dramatic overgrowth that would make our neighborhoods unfriendly and unfun and, and overdeveloped. I, grew up in a city and I moved here for a reason and I don't want to have to leave. And I love being able to walk to a city and yet live in the country. I live across the street from a farm. My child sees the goat every day. These are wonderful parts of our, there's tractors on our street. We don't need 50 cars and the tractors. I mean, it's just insane the idea that you would develop this neighborhood in such a way. I really feel like, I also look at your maps and I feel really frustrated. I feel really mad because really what needs to happen is a remapping and people are ducking that real issue and I feel very sad and disappointed with Northampton for that. Um, it's very clear that the sort of more wealthy neighborhoods are in green and the traditionally less wealthy neighborhoods are in pink. And we are, yes, fairly close to the city but so is one of those pretty green neighborhoods or just on the border. We're not really that far from there. So um, I, I urge you to take a second look at this, at least for our neighborhood. I, I really think it would, you know, ruin it. Any other specific comment on C? Sorry. Please. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Tom Holden. I live on Henry Street as well. Um, I don't have uh, too much to say. Just uh, with regard to uh, lots that would conform to um, larger projects. 
and I just wondered what the city will do when someone comes up by the by the new regulations of the uh, URC changes. It looks like for every uh, 8,000 feet, you could have four units. Is that right? Um, in urban residential C, um, it's 2,500 square feet per unit, so um, 10, it's 10,000 square feet. And so in keeping, what is the city's job in keeping with the character of the neighborhood with regard to approving projects that might happen in, in a particular neighborhood? If someone wants to develop, do a high uh, uh, condens, uh, Go for condens it, type of uh, development. Please. So, <clears throat> the um, requirement um, would be, um, you know, if you want to do a four family or um, a townhouse project, again, it would be site plan approval, which is anything over 2,000 square feet of, of um, development in the building area, triggers planning board review. So, the planning board um, <laughs> would have to analyze the um, application based on the zoning, which um, requires orientation of buildings to the street front, requires um, by the standards um, covered entry and compatibility with the neighborhood character. So they'd be looking at that and as well as parking was raised as an issue and distribution of parking. So for four units you, you might need eight parking spaces depending on the size of the unit. Um, you might need eight parking spaces so those would have to be done in a way that's consistent with the design standard. And then there is that uh, pending proposal um, that's been advertised to require a special permit for the construction of five, I'm um, sorry, um, seven or more um, units, um, either multifamily or townhouse, that then would be a different voting threshold and that you need two-thirds approval from the planning board um, uh, under review, as opposed to site plan, which is technical um, design related. So with regard to these larger one acre lots, if someone wanted to come in and do four, five, or six units, that's pretty much a, a, a pretty easy thing to, to get through the, the process? <clears throat> well, if you had a one acre parcel and you could show that um, there, uh, that you could meet the parking in the open space um, and still do six units, as part of site plan review, <clears throat> the planning board would make sure that it meets the standards in, in the zoning, the design layout, and but, then yes, it would But the city out. doesn't necessarily do any type of review with regard to the character of the neighborhood? Yes, that? the applicant would have to show that. That's not the case now, so there are some examples you raised that are, you know, don't fit into the neighborhood, and I think probably um, several people could point to the same project that you may be referring to. And so there were design standards relative to um, some of those um, units at, at the time that they were built. This represents a change so that we don't continue having new development that um, doesn't respect sort of the layout and the form of a neighborhood. And so it would be the onus would be on the applicant to show how that um, works and how it fits into the neighborhood. And, and typically as part of site plan, the, board members go out and do site visits. So I think I think we are just concerned about the um, you know these larger lots that are available and that people may want to get to carry away of but you know just to over develop and be out of character with the neighborhood and it sounds like um, there's not going to be a lot of control to prevent that from happening. If the lots are indeed big enough, as, as we sort of have uh, on our street, on one side of the street, they're all like one acre-ish lots. Um, and nobody wants to see overdevelopment in that area. And I thought a few months ago when we were here, there was some discussion about rezoning. Um, well, changing the, so back the, in September and through the fall, there was a discussion and a concern that the minimum lot size proposed was sort of a flat um, um, lot size, and that that would allow um, lots of units, essentially, on a parcel. Now, since then, based on that concern, the proposal is going to, to a per unit cap, so not 20 units on an acre, but actually more like... Um, you know, 12 or something. Um, but there are also wetlands to take into consideration. There are wetlands along the dike. There are um, there are a lot of factors that go 
and two reviewing, so it's hard to know exactly how many units could be built, but certainly with the design character and looking at where the parking is, it could be that you can't fit the parking and 12 units on a parcel um, and meet the standards. You might be able to do it, but it's probably a case-by-case -case scenario. It also would require someone to tear down a house to do that, so there's an evaluation as to whether that makes sense. But that doesn't, that's can you, near can the you please wait until he's done and you can come back up? I am pretty much done. I just, I think, um, you know, Jim, Jim Nash said a lot of great things, and um, I'm just voicing my concern about the, the, our neighborhoods getting, you know, just an overzealous uh, developer uh, getting carried away. That's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please. <coughs> Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. First of all, is there a way that Henry Street, that area, could be taken out of this proposal and that there would be some attention specifically made to the special conditions there? Is that a possibility that the city could do that in the zoning? Um, I, I think that um, it... There's always a possibility for map changes. I think the idea about Henry Street, and I think the board has had this conversation before, and that's one of the reasons why I showed the map up there, is looking at um, a broader scope of sustainability issues. Yes, there may be some deep parcels here and there, but I think to the extent that we're looking at, you know, we know there's a demand for different types of housing units, and we want to make sure that those are distributed throughout the community and not just um, you know, targeting mapped areas mm -hmm. for one type of development versus another. That's true. Um, but um, again, so the, the planning board would be in a position of determining if the special permit process came forward, whether or not it made sense for more than seven units to be developed in a certain location. But I think given the proximity to downtown, if you're looking at, um, you know, where there might be a beneficial place to allow some number of units that it's still within that quarter of a half mile ring. So from that perspective, I think the board and, and certainly staff have talked about it being um, an appropriate place for new housing. So, so there's no way you're going to take Henry Street in that area and make it a special case like as a street. Basically. Well, what's on the tables is are the district changes. So right. So at this point, that that's what the council is reviewing. I mean, we've heard how dense it is on William Street and Pomeroy and Henry and Valley and all of these areas. So if you were to take a sort of average over there, I would say we're a de very dense neighborhood. And so the fact that we have these big lots. You know, if you, I, w I would say, why don't you look at us as an average and say, in this area, this corner of the city, like uh, sort of um, Pleasant Street, uh, in towards you know towards the dike, that that we sh you should maybe leave us just as we are, basically. Um, and I'll just, and another thing I want to add is that because we have this area there and we're downtown, the neighborhood is very susceptible to people holding onto property if someone dies and the house goes vacant. They hold on it for a long time because they know that they can, the zoning's coming and they're going to make a big killing by developing these properties. So it happened on the parcel, alas, a farmer was holding onto his field hoping to retire on this parcel, and we had to go in the neighborhood. We had many, many proposals for development where now Jim Nash is, lives, thank goodness, in one house there, and we have Town Farm. But there's another house on Henry Street which is being held onto this property just like it seems waiting. The house is falling down. So this doesn't serve us very well. And this is why I'm asking on some level if there isn't some way to give consideration. It's a very, very unique neighborhood. It's a farming community. We live on, in the urban area, but we're a farming community. And somehow this seems to be being lost in the conversation that we're part of like Round Hill and all of these other areas. But if you go down there and you see what we're talking about, plus we have the sewage plant down there. So we have a lot of things weighing on us in this neighborhood. So whatever. I'm just saying it just doesn't, that we, it, it feels very, um, it feels very uncreative to, to have this, this particular neighborhood. And I'm just talking about those streets, Williams, 
you know, Montview, Valley, Henry, to be lumped in with this big plan, which I think doesn't really meet our needs. What I, what I might point out is that this, um, this doesn't make any map changes, simply changes what's permitted within the zones. But if as a neighborhood you wanted to have your councilor sponsor a change of zone for a certain part of the neighborhood, you're very welcome to do that. I mean, that would be separate from this ordinance, but if you feel the unique nature of the neighborhood justifies it being switched to a different zone, ask your counselor to make a, a change in zone at some point. process for that? Hmm? What's the process for that? Can you explain that a little it's bit? It's done by ordinance, so it would require a, a map change under ordinance. Hmm? Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels? Thank you. Uh, Owen Freeman Daniels, uh, the Ward 3 City Councilor. I'm the Councilor <coughs> for uh, Henry Street, Valley Street, Montview. Um, and uh, I intended to uh, make a uh, map change request or, or put through the uh, uh, sponsor of the ordinance to change it until uh, the uh, planning board's package came before the council and was referred to uh, the, the committee that I sit on, the Committee for Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use. And uh, what I saw was that the, um, possibly the most logical uh, zoning change would be to go from URC to URB. But uh, the significant changes between B and C had been relatively um, diminished by this package that uh, I did not see a, a real tremendous way to um, stave off the kind of development concerns that uh, many of the residents had um, discussed by using a map change. Um, so I instead recommended an amendment that uh, that uh, required a special permit process for all developments that were seven units or greater, uh, which uh, um, Ms. Mish has alluded to a few times. And um, it may not go far enough, but uh, I hope that the uh, Ordinance Committee and the Planning Board keeps an open mind about it uh, as they hear these concerns from uh, many of the residents that, uh, that I represent. Thank you. The, um, we, and that, suggestion is why we're going to continue both of our public hearings tonight because that that is a, a change making the ordinance more restrictive and we're required to re-advertise that so um, we've alluded to it tonight but there's been no public notice given uh, with regards to that so we'll all be back here at our next meetings to again address that so people will have a, an ability to comment on it that didn't know it was on tonight's agenda. All right, so that will be, um, that was well received at uh, uh, Economic Development Planning Land Use and may be well received here as well, but we've got to wait to another public hearing to deal with that more specifically. So it, it appears at this point that everybody's had a chance to speak once. And I'm happy to go around one more time, but I'd like to hear some, 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 something substantially new other than I don't like it. You know, come up with some substance, and I'm happy to have you come around again. Start over. All right. Uh, Jim Nash again of Montfield, 18 Montfield. Okay, so the Watrous property on Henry Street could have 17 units. Ed Glowatsky's property... Uh, could have 14. Uh, to, uh, Tom and Kim Holden's property could have 14 to 15 units. Uh, Al Griggs' property uh, could have 18. This is, this is about a third of the properties in the neighborhood. My own property could have 18. So we're going from one family, two families. This is, this is, this is why we're concerned. Okay, it's just the numbers. Mm -hmm. All right. Back to the side. You still have a that's, that's, that's my I mean, that's it's just so drastic. It's so dramatic, and it's so not in keeping with what you say you want. So it seems like you're pulling the wool over our eyes and throwing <laughs> the development in our yard. Sir, um, the 
this is very quick. Uh, as to the possibility of the planning board preserving the character of the neighborhood, there was a site plan recently approved in our neighborhood that will increase traffic by an estimated 300 percent. So that's that's a limited uh, check on on uh, development that changes the character of the neighborhood. Okay. Uh, that's a question. Because it seems like most of the changes are pretty much doubling the um, the lot size. So in the examples we just heard for the few parcels that were given that would be changed from one or two family residents to 14 units, 16 units. Is it fair to say that in the present um, zoning, those could actually be seven units? No. Or, I mean, so th that's just my question. I'm trying to figure out. So, so though, though we may have a lot of folks living in a single family unit right now, by the current zoning, the person who's living there could in fact uh, build a four unit, six unit structure on the unit, on the property that they currently live, currently live on. I see people shaking their heads, but I'd like to have some confirmation. Yeah, so the zoning is one, uh, you know, Covered. residential seeing one unit for 6,000 square feet. So currently, many of the units down on the areas that we're talking about, by right, by the current use right now, the current zoning, could be where there are a single or site plan approval. Well, so it depends on the frontage, but um, so many could be yeah. expanded triply, quadruply than by the current zoning that exists right now. I see people shaking their heads. So maybe. I yeah, yeah can, you, that, so. can you please come up so we can see you and hear you if you have something <laughs> to say to us? Yeah. Yeah. When we had a meeting with you, we went over this and we, we, we went through these, these units and it was clear that you weren't allowed to currently divide them based on the frontage and you weren't allowed to add more than two or three families because that's the current zoning in our area. And so they're all two families or one, one's a two family, they're all mostly one families. But with the future changes, you could do 14, 16 units, which is a dramatic change from two or three. I think, so there is a difference between dividing the land and creating a separate lot. I'm just talking about creating then, a number of units yes, right, rather right. than, the number yeah. of units because there was a reference, and, and for those of us who've been doing, you know, working on this um, the sustainability plan for the last eight years or even prior to that, the SDAC plans that did extensive public outreach and had a lot of input there was a lot of discussion about the paucity of housing units within the within the city within the city center. That was really what generally what the discussion was whether those be contained units in one single structure or, or the, the and we saw some of the figures earlier that just showed that um, family sizes were decreasing and you know national studies show that there are in fact more more single people without children than even single or married people with children, that that creates a need for housing for those people. So I'm just saying, just over the years of doing that work, it seems as though there were some plans that, some reasoning that went behind um, creating opportunities for that type of housing that would accommodate those families that were different than those that were larger. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these houses that were built Almost 100 years ago, had much larger families in them too. So, okay. so um, any other discussion on C? We still have one more ordinance to do. So, Jim, one. I just want to clarify for Maureen: the reason none of these properties can be developed in this manner right now is because they do not have the required frontage of 120 square f uh, of 120 feet to do a, a, a large development. By reducing the frontage to 50 feet, that opens up all of these properties to that kind of development. And by the way, it does the th same thing in URD and URA. So, any other discussion specifically on C? Seeing no hands, any discussion up here at this point on these? No, that's okay. all right. Then, then our uh, final ordinance is 350-6.8a. This is permitting more than one structure uh, on a parcel. And you want to just, it's been a while since we talked about that, you want to just refresh everybody's memory? Sure, so right now um, there's a section of the ordinance that's not in the tables that sort of addresses all um, properties that 
for um, single family, um, in the case of single two or three family structures, you can't have more than one principal structure on a parcel. So one of the things that um, was discussed quite a bit through this um, post adoption of the plan and the zoning revisions committee was the fact that if you could allow multiple structures on a parcel that were detached, you might be able to get at more, um, uh, build something that's more in character with neighborhoods where you've got detached, smaller detached structures. So the idea was to allow flexibility of how you locate your units on a parcel. And even under current zoning, we had um, issues where people are doing townhouse units that might not exactly fit into the neighborhood, but they're doing it that way because there's no other mechanism of doing that. The other piece of this ordinance um, is also to eliminate some of the additional special permit allowances um, that were instituted going back 10, 15 <coughs> years ago to try to create the flexibility in the face of not having, you know, having zoning that wasn't matching neighborhoods. So if the ordinance passes to reduce lot size and allow more flexibility, then these special permits are no longer necessary. So, so those are the nature of the changes. So in other words, if it matched the neighborhood, rather than to have two units attached, to have two detached units that were more in character right. with the other structures, I think you had a slide for that that yeah. showed an older house with a new addition on it and then a big open space because they couldn't put in another smaller structure. Yeah. So that's that point. Is there any public comment on this one? All right. Seeing none, any discussion up here on where we are at this point. So that, that concludes everything that we had to present tonight. And as I mentioned, um, because of the proposal from um, Economic Development Land Use, we're going to continue our public hearing so that proposal for seven or more units requiring a special permit can be advertised and then addressed at that public hearing. Um, so that for you all, it's June 10th. 10, 10. For the planning board, it'll be May 23rd. Okay. So, we, yeah, we we do, in fact, let the planning, you want to do your... We need a motion to continue this part Who's of the chair? Okay. Who's the chair? Who's the chair? Uh, Mr. Pierce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Right. So we just need a motion to... To continue, continue the rest of this till May 23rd. On May 23rd at this site. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.